Andy Johnson, Minnesota State University. We are looking at the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test Revised Normative Update, as this is a type of measure that is commonly found on IEPs. In and of itself, it is not sufficient. With any standardized measure, you must ask yourself, is it valid? Does it predict students' ability to create meaning with print? That is reading, not sounding out words, but creating meaning. Or does it simply predict their ability to perform on a similar test of reading subscales? Does it provide diagnostic data? Does it tell us what the problem is? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What type of instruction is needed? Are the testing conditions similar to real life reading situations? Or are they artificial? Do they enable the reader to use all three queuing systems or simply one? And does it tell us what queuing systems that students actually use? What are their strengths and weaknesses? Most standardized measures that I have found that provide quantifiable data are based on this outdated model of reading, the phonological processing model, which defines reading simply as sounding out words. Words appear on the page, we bark at them, poof, poof, we sound them out, and they go from the page to our thalamus up to the cortex. The transactive view of reading, which is supported by the latest research in cognitive neuroscience, says that reading is an interactive process. What's in the cortex interacts with what's on the page to create meaning. And there are more is more information flowing from the cortex down than from the thalamus up. And we use three queuing systems, phonics, syntax, and semantics. Of the three, the phonics or phonological is the least efficient. All right, parts of the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, Readiness Cluster, these things, and we'll take a look at each one of them and ask yourself, how does this reflect the transactive view of reading? Visual auditory learning measures the ability to form association between visual stimuli and oral responses. Okay, this is important. But is it creating meaning with print? Is it focusing on the three queuing systems? It has a rebus, graphic-like forms for familiar words and use them to read a sentence. A rebus is a representation of words or symbols using pictures. Okay, that tells us something. I don't know if that's a readiness skill. I'm not quite sure what this is. They have object naming. That's time. Students are asked to name each object in a timed sort of thing. However, the naming is affected by their concept knowledge, vocabulary, exposure, and the culture from which they come. Does this adequately reflect their ability to create meaning with text? Letter identification, the ability to identify letters presented in upper or lower case. Again, this is important, but again, it reflects the phonological model. It doesn't reflect the three queuing systems. It's it, Phonological awareness looks at beginning sounds, the ability to hear sounds within words. Okay, for sound matching, these are teeth. Find the word uh, picture with the similar sounding uh, beginning sound. Ending sounds, broom. Find the picture that has the same ending sound, frog, stick, or dime, and they identify that. This is phonemic awareness, the ability to hear sounds within words. Phonological awareness or phonemic awareness, middle sounds, the ability to hear sounds within words, all right? And by the way, the research on the importance of phonemic awareness is mixed. It's correlational. It's not causal. We know that students, young readers who perform well, their ability to perform well on phonemic awareness tests is correlated with uh, high scores in reading, but does one cause the other? Is it a causal relationship? We cannot assume that causation means correlation. Correlation means causation. And blending sounds, the ability to hear sounds within words. I'm going to say one part of the word, pop, corn. Tell me what word makes pop, corn. Pop and corn make popcorn, blended, all right? Phonemic, ability to hear sounds within words. And deleting sounds. I say pancake without pan, what do you get? All right, this is the ability to hear sounds within words, but is it related to creating meaning with print? And again, it focuses on just one aspect of the phonological cueing system, just a little part of the triangle, 
Reading is an interactive process. It ignores these other two. The basic skills cluster, word identification and word attack. Again, students are asked to list, uh, read a list of real words in isolation. But again, reading is creating meaning with print. Sounding out words is only one way to identify words. There's six ways to identify them. And if you sound a word in isolation or see it in isolation, you're looking at only phonological cueing, not the most or the most efficient cueing system, the semantics in syntax. This is not real reading. Identifying and sounding out words in isolation is not real reading. It provides no context. This is the most controversial one. Students are given 45 nonsense words and asked to sound them out correctly. Blip, duds, we, all right? This is not real reading. You can't make sense out of nonsense. And reading is cre uh, reading meaning with print. You can't make sense out of nonsense. Part three, reading comprehension. This is probably the closest uh, that uh, the closest reflection of a transactive view of reading. However, students are given a word and asked to generate antonyms, synonyms, and analogies. This is said to demonstrate their word knowledge, but generating these things versus comprehending or creating meaning with print. I don't know that this necessarily reflects students' ability to create meaning with print. The brain is a meaning-making organism. organism. All right. Read this word out loud and tell me it's opposite bad. All right. It's word knowledge instead of students' ability to create meaning with print. The brain's ability to look at something and create meaning with it. The words and concepts students are exposed to or have been exposed to will affect their results here. Does this reflect creating meaning with print? And again, synonyms, same thing. Word knowledge versus the ability to create meaning with print. I don't know. Analogies, the same thing. Read this out loud and tell me the answer. Red is to stop as green is to blank. This is word knowledge, maybe conceptual knowledge, versus the ability to create meaning with print. The words and concepts a student has been exposed to will affect the results here. Does it reflect students' ability to create meaning with print? The second part, passage comprehension. Okay, I'm okay with this. Students are given a passage or short paragraphs, each containing a missing word. Students are asked to read each segment and supply the missing word, all right? This has to do with meaning making. This makes the most sense to me. The girl plays with her. Again, your brain has to make sense of that. Passage comprehension, the cat is standing on a blank in the doorway, okay? Two additional subtests, listening comprehension, oral reading fluency, point to the child who is running. Right? This is kind of a meaning-making sort of thing. Not quite sure what this has to do with anything. Listening comprehension, you listen, you see which one makes sense. Is this listening? Is this meaning-making? Is this remembering? And then oral reading fluency. This tells us something, okay? But remember this. Sometimes when we are checking for comprehension, we read slowly. Both the level and the type of reading material affect reading rate. So reading rates should always be presented in context. Again, with any standardized measure, is it valid? Does it predict students' ability to create meaning with print? Or does it predict their ability to perform on a similar reading subskills test? Is it diagnostic? Does it tell you what kind of instruction is needed? Does it tell you what the problems are? Are the testing conditions similar to real life reading situations? In the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, I ask myself that many times. Does it enable the reader to use all three queuing systems? Ask yourself that. Does it tell us what queuing systems students use? Which are the strongest? My recommendations, you need to get much more diagnostic data. You get this from a diagnostic reading assessment, such as the informal reading inventory or the qualitative reading inventory. MISQ analysis provides a much more authentic meaning-making situation, and the Woodcock provides general data, but by itself it is not sufficient. It should always be augmented with other type of data, and again, I recommend some form of diagnostic reading assessment.